my brains back there. Okay. In looking through Hebrews, we're talking about the superiority of Christ. Uh, through him, we have a better hope, better covenant, better promises, better sacrifices. And we're looking forward to a better, that is a heavenly country. So God has provided something better for us. And the idea is, of course, that the Hebrew Christians in Christ had something far better than they ever had in Judaism. And the writer is trying to encourage them to uh, stay the course, to endure, and uh, wind up with Jesus in the end. Uh, we come to a place where in the last part of chapter 6, he was uh, pointing us to our hope that we have in Christ. If we will believe and hold fast, hold steadfast to uh, the truth, that we have this hope uh, that's set before us as an anchor of the soul. Um, if you read verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into the presence behind the veil. So you get this picture of going into the presence of God as if in the tabernacle or temple behind the veil where he actually is. Our forerunner has gone there for us, leading the way for us. Where the forerunner has entered into for us, even Jesus having become our high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So that begs the question that's going to be answered in chapter 7. How can Christ be a high priest? And what kind of high priest will he be? Uh, Hebrew Christians would have understood, obviously, the importance of a high priest and their relationship with God. Uh, the writers already asserted that Christ is a high priest, and after the order of Melchizedek, as we've just seen, he said it three times before. He says it in chapter 6 and verse 20, so four times so far. In essence, he's already said that, but now he takes uh, on the task of demonstrating why that's true, how it's true, and what's important about it, why it's so significant to us. So he's described uh, as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, uh, and as I said, this order has not been yet explained, but it's going to be. But it's asserted again here in chapter 6 and verse 20. So the questions in the mind of Hebrew readers would have been, how can he be a high priest? A uh, priest were to come from the tribe of Levi, high priest from the lineage of Aaron. Uh, this Jesus doesn't qualify for that. Uh, and so the Hebrew writer takes this question up um, and answers it extensively. So he says in verses 1 and 2, starting in chapter 7 now, This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of, pre, king of peace. So Melchizedek's mentioned twice in the Old Testament, uh, in the story in Genesis 14 and in the prophetic psalm, Psalm 110 and verse 4, where the coming Christ is said to be a priest uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek, the name, means king of righteousness. Okay? He's also the king of Salem. Salem, shalom, if you will, is the Hebrew word for peace. So he is both king of righteousness and king of peace. Um, there's a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 6 that specifically outlines that the Messiah, the Christ, would be both a king and a priest on his throne. The text specifically says that. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Uh, the man whose name is the branch, he'll branch out, he'll build the temple, he'll sit and rule on his throne, he'll sh he shall be a priest on his throne. And that's again Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13. Then in verse 3 of chapter 7, this Melchizedek uh, that he's talking about is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, we assume there, I, I think and it's probably a good assumption, that he, he's using Melchizedek of the Old, Old Testament and what the information that we have about him somewhat metaphorically. Uh, don't ne necessarily think that he literally is saying this Melchizedek just popped up in existence and didn't have a father and mother and then just, you know, never did die or anything like that. But there's no record of any of that, I think, is, you know, kind of what's being said. And so, metaphorically, uh, it, it would represent uh, the priesthood of Christ. 
his priesthood was plainly not determined by genealogy, for no genealogy is mentioned. Okay, so that, that didn't determine it. That's, that's plain. Uh, he had no recorded beginning, no recorded end, and so in that way he remains a priest continually. So Christ is a priest after this order, the order of Melchizedek. Pick up in verse 4, talking still about Melchizedek and considering the greatness of this person. Consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham, Abraham gave a tenth of his spoil. So Abraham, as you remember, returning from the slaughter of the kings, uh, gave a tenth uh, of the spoils to Melchizedek. He says, Indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. For he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, so to speak. And you get that so to speak there, right? So again, it's uh, sort of metaphorically speaking. Uh, for he was still in the loins of Abraham, his father, when Melchizedek met him. So some of the things that then are asserted by, about this, the greatness of Melchizedek, he paid tithes. Uh, Abraham paid him tithes, we should say. That, that's part of the historical record. Uh, the Levitical priests, who are descendants of Abraham, received tithes from their brethren, but in turn, through Abraham, they paid tithes to Melchizedek. And, and so that indicates their position of, you know, lower than that of Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. The text in Genesis 14 tells us that. And the less is blessed by the better. Um, Again, that's just the way blessings flow, right? From, from the greater to the lesser. Um, the greater is in the position to give the blessing. And Melchizedek received tithes as one lives. So he's using this concept of we have no record of his death, so he lives. He's not a mere mortal in that sense. And then even Levi played, paid tithes through Abraham. So the greatness of Abraham... Um, makes all of those facts about Melchizedek even more significant. I mean, how great is Abraham? How do the Hebrews regard him? Well, father, father of us all, father of the nation, uh, and, and all Jews would have you know, agreed to that. The, the, the greatest patriarch of all, uh, going back through their, their genealogy. So the greatness of Abraham makes these, these facts that the writers just listed even more significant. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek. Abraham's uh, descendants paid tithes through him. To, so all of that saying this Melchizedek is extraordinary, um, unique, uh, far above the Levitical priesthood, far above Abraham as far as that goes. Um, and much more could be said about that. But I guess one of the things that you can say about Abraham from the scriptures, Second uh, Chronicles, Isaiah 41, He's called the friend of God. So here's the greatness of Abraham, and yet Melchizedek has to be greater. Uh, and that's a point well taken, plainly. So all of this um, indicates a, a change in priesthood, that Christ's priesthood, which is after the order of Melchizedek, is uh, significantly different from the Levitical Aaronic priesthood that they had been used to. So, picking up in verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? All right. So, since the Levitical priesthood did not bring perfection, it was, and he'll deal with this more later, but um, since it did not bring perfection, uh, another priest after the order of Melchizedek is needed, you see that in verse 11, then the change of the priesthood necessitates a change in the law. The priesthood being changed, and we're in verse 12 now, the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. The law governed the priesthood, right? 
So if you've changed the priesthood, the law has got to be changed or you're breaking it. Uh, for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe of which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. This is a critical point uh, in, in not only the discussion of the priesthood of Melchizedek and Christ being after that order. Plainly, this is a key point to be made. Here's the turning point of this whole argument, guys. And it's based on uh, that silence does not arise. It's based on a necessary implication. Is everybody hearing me? When we talk about necessary implications, the whole main argument in this point is that silence on something doesn't authorize, and this, this point that the writer is making here, the fact that God didn't say anything about priests coming from the tribe of Judah, what does that necessarily imply? They can come from the tribe of Judah under the law, right? That's what he's saying. So Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, which th Moses spoke what about that? He said nothing about it. Did he ever say, you shall not have a priest from the tribe of Judah? No. He just said, here's where the priests are supposed to come from. So when God tells us something, then anything else is no. He's, he's been silent about that when he, once he's spoken on something. It's a critical point in our understanding of how we establish uh, what God wants us to do today. Um, it's the same premise and principle. Silence prohibits. Go back in your Old Testament history. You remember Isaiah? What did he do? Offered. What, what did he do that was bad? He went in the temple, offered incense as a priest would. You remember what was said? You know, the priests come in. It is not for you, Isaiah, to do this. This belongs to the priests. Anybody want to tell me what tribe Isaiah was from? Yes. 12 guesses and the first 11 don't count. <laughs> Judah. Yeah, he's a descendant of David. So you get the point there? If, if you could have a, price, a priest from the tribe of Judah, well, Isaiah would have been great. He'd have been golden, but no, that wasn't allowed. Um, and so you have, you have this, uh, you know, just laid out in really plain terms for us here. Uh, let's, let's pick it up in verse 15 then. It's far more evident, so if that's evident, it's far more evident that if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, which the Old Testament priests had come, but according to the power of an endless life, for he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110 quote, Psalm 110 and verse 4. For, um, all right, well, let me just, Stop there and just notice that the Lord promised to ordain this priest to come according to the order of Melchizedek. And he did not come, as it's been stated, uh, because the law of Moses ordained it, but by the power of his endless life. In that way, he had the same qualifications as Melchizedek. The power of an endless life. That would be something you would have to have if you're going to be a priest after that order, right? You see what the argument that he's making, he's, Melchizedek had this endless life thing going, so whoever would take a priesthood according to that order, they'd have to have that as well. All right, then in verse, um, I, I already talked about this quite a bit. Um, biblical silence does not authorize or give permission. Don't have time to go over that again, although it would be good. Um, Christ is our high priest and we are all priests. And these are two good points that could be made. I'm not going to take the time to go over all that, all that right now. Obviously, those, that first point would be one that you would emphasize with the children about Christ being our high priest. So, that leads us into this next section, verses uh, 18 through 28. And just a quick overview of it. A lot of times it helps me to get what's, you know, what's coming in my mind so I can see the flow of it as I go through it. I mean, uh, better things from a better priesthood. You're going to have a better hope. Same salvation to the uttermost, sin sacrifice sufficient for all men for all time. So this, all these things make our priesthood or the priesthood of Christ superior 
to the Levitical one. So pick it up in verse 18 now. On the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its unweakness and unprofitableness. Now, if I were to ask you, um, why was the former commandment was this? Why was it weak and unprofitable? Now, the writer's going to tell us a couple of reasons, but to ask you that. Why was the old law weak and unprofitable? It couldn't forgive sins. Hmm. Couldn't forgive sins. Couldn't, the, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. And the other thing the Hebrew writer said is because of man's sinfulness. Because, you know, here man was a sinner and then you had blood of bulls and goats, you couldn't take away sin. So that's where our mind normally goes. Exactly so, Colton, when we try to answer that question. But what he's coming to really in this particular section is it was weak and unprofitable because uh, the priesthood was not up to snuff, so to speak. There were limitations to that priesthood. Okay, that's really the argument that he's going to make here. Um, so it's weak and unprofitable. The law was, the law was weak because of its inferior sacrifices, because of and the inability of those to take away sin. The present context, though, is that the weakness relates to the priesthood. So, so notice this with me as we go through. Um, the law made nothing perfect. There's a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So this is, this is far better. We can actually get close to God now. And inasmuch as he, is not with, he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, Psalm 110, going back to that prophetic quotation. The point here being made is that those Old Testament priests were priests because a law said so, and they met the qualifications of that law by genealogy. Okay. Christ becomes a high priest because of a promise of God, an oath of God, not just a promise, but an oath. I have sworn and will not relent. All right. So that's, to me, well, on the face of it, that's a much stronger way. You're what you are because of some, you know, legal happenstance. But you're what you are because God swore that you would be this. You see the difference in the strength of that? Um, then another issue with that Old Testament priesthood is that the priests could not continue as priests because they died. Um, Jesus became a surety of a better covenant. He's a better priest, uh, established with an oath of God, so that means the covenant's got to be better. Then verse 23, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him, for, for them. Sorry. Um, so priests are con uh, prevented by death from continuing. They had to daily offer sacrifices. Our high priest in verse 26, the one who's fitting for us, is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens, does not need to daily offer those sacrifices as those high priests did uh, for, for first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people he offered one sacrifice for all when he offered up himself and then for the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness but the word of the oath which came from the law which came after the law i should say appoints the son who has been perfected forever so think about all of that um, christ has brought in a better hope Based on this better priesthood, he was made priest by God's oath, is what we've said. Um, a law can be annulled. What about an oath of God? Can we just snap change that? Then that's not going to change, is it? So you have the difference there. He's sworn and will not relent, as we said. The permanence of Christ's priest, priesthood guarantees the better, more enduring nature of the covenant. All right. Uh, the law had many priests, but... They were prevented from continuing by death, as we said. Then Christ continues forever because he has an unchangeable priesthood and um, the power of his everlasting life will ever live to make intercession for us.
All right, questions or additional thoughts on all of that? I have a little bit more to all of that, I think. All right. We're doing great. So look at this. A better priesthood is able to save to the uttermost. I've spent some time thinking about uttermost. Um, it's... Um, well, never mind. I know it's... <laughs> quantity, it's also quality of salvation. That makes any sense. Uh, salvation is for now. It was not under the Levitical priesthood. N nobody could draw near, even under that system, which was so imperfect, nobody could draw near who wasn't a Jew, right? This is spiritual need is amply supplied, which was not the case in the priesthood of the Old Testament. There were, were a number of things that were lacking, right, uh, that were unsatisfying so to speak, spiritually. It was designed to be that way, but you need to understand that. So both in quality, quantity, and in quality, it's superior. Christ is able to be our high priest. He's perfectly qualified. These terms that describe him, holy, harmless, separated from sinners. And because he's able to offer the best sacrifice, he offered himself once for all. The effects of the sacrifice are permanent. There is no reminder of sin year after year. He offered himself up once. So, looking back on all of that, which priest would you rather have? One appointed by the law or one appointed by an eternal oath? One taken from men or one who is God's son? One who is weaknesses or one who has been perfected? Weaknesses contrasted with perfected. And, you know, there's an obvious choice, and that's what's being laid out for these Hebrew Christians. All right, so the priesthood of Christ is kind of the main point of what the writer is saying to us in this section. Uh, and it's driving to Christ being the mediator of a superior covenant. Look at chapter 8 and verse 1. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So Christ, Christ, um, as high priest after the order of Melchizedek, being born and priest, and he's going to be a minister, it says, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. We're going to do this consideration of things that are real and heavenly as opposed to things of the old law that were earthly and copies of heavenly things. Okay, So he sort of introduces that concept here as well. Jesus is a minister of the real sanctuary where people can actually go into the presence of God with a, with a high priest who has offers blood that can cleanse their sins. So all of this is, that's the real stuff. Everything else was just like a, a model or a copy, a uh, shadow of it, as he, he calls it. Um, and, and so he says, uh, again, the true tabernacle, this is something that's erected by God and not man, but it's in the heavens. Verse 3, every high priest is wanted to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So that's part of the deal of being a high priest, right? You offer gifts and sacrifices on the one, for, on behalf of the ones for whom you're serving as high priest. So, therefore, it's necessary that this one, that is Christ, also have something to offer. Um, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. His offering could not be the same as the priests on earth if it were. That's what we call superfluous redundancy, right? Or redundancy, redundancy. So that's <laughs> just the same thing, same thing. So it's, it's got to be different. Uh, why would we have a change in the priesthood and the change in the law if the sacrifice is the same, right? So there's got to be uh, a change in, in that in, as well. Um, he says in verse 5, those priests, 
and again, here are the, here's the, here are the words. They, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mount. Two or three things about some of these words here. Um, the copy, which is a representation of something that's real. Um, you know, you could, I don't know if any of these markers actually write. So, you know, here's a, if I drew something like that, well, that's either a stalk of broccoli or a tree. Let's go with a tree, right? So I'm saying, I'm, this is the tree in my front yard. Right over here, okay. You say, no, it's not. It's a copy. It's not a very good one. <laughs> this is the type. This is what represents it. If you put, you know, you show a drawing to a kid, you could do this in your classes. You know, tree, house, whatever it is. That's a house. That's a tree. No, this is a drawing of a house or a tree. There's the house. There's the tree. That's the real thing. That's, that's the difference between the copy and, you know, and what it's really representing. Um, and that's, that's what these words are. The word pattern, uh, that, as it's translated there in verse 5, the Greek word is tupos. We get our word type from that. Like the type on a typewriter that makes the impression. Okay, So that's Again, the concept of it, it follows it, ex it exact representation of something, it but it represents it, okay? And it doesn't, doesn't deviate from, from one to the next. Um, so all of that, I think, is important for us to understand about not only the change in the priesthood, but just how God works uh, in using types and shadows heavenly realities. So Moses is instructed to make all these things according to the pattern. I think that's very significant. Um, and the principle of following God's pattern applies to us as well. Of course, I've been preaching about that, so I won't belabor all of that again right now. But uh, you just see it all over Scripture. Uh, whoever goes onward does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. There's something to be you know, held onto there, something to stay with. Hebrew writer talks about holding fast to what we've been given, staying with what you've been given, um, you know, not adding to, taking away from, uh, no other gospel, just all kinds of different ways of approaching that, but the scriptures say it over and over again. God's given us what he wants us to have, stay with that. Don't, don't mess with it, don't go into anything else. Um, so that leads us kind of into uh, this discussion of the new covenant. Verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. So in a, a ministry is work, work to do, service. So Jesus has a whole lot better work to do and service that he performs in this way. He's obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Better covenant, better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And here's what we normally think about when we think about the fault in the first covenant, as we were talking about earlier. Finding fault with them, what was their fault? They didn't keep it. They didn't keep their, their end of the bargain. So that's the main weakness of the Old Covenant, is that man didn't keep his, his part. Finding fault with them, he says, and then he quotes from uh, Jeremiah 31, from uh, verse 8 uh, all the way into uh, verse 12. Let's read that. Finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of jo Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me 
from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It has better promises. The first covenant accomplished the purpose that God had for it, but that purpose was not uh, his completed purpose in Christ. The fault again in the first covenant was man's imperfection and no remedy for it was um, provided. So the new covenant is promised by God. We see that uh, again this section in Hebrews from verses 8 through 12 quoted in Jeremiah, from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Uh, it would be made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Uh, I think it's important to realize that just as the promises to the seed of Abraham had spiritual fulfillment, it's not the seed of Abraham physically that's the seed of Abraham, right? We're children of Abraham by faith, right? So that there's a spiritual fulfillment to those promises given to Abraham. And that's the same that it, that in, in this case. The promise made to Israel and Judah, who is spiritual Israel today? Well, it's the church. Okay, again, you've got lots of passages that uh, relate to that. These promises would be for, for spiritual Israel. And Paul even calls us spiritual Israel in Galatians 6, 15 and 16. Uh, so th this, this new covenant is going to be unlike the old in some key ways, uh, mainly... Uh, in the old, they didn't continue in it. They didn't keep his covenant. And so God disregarded them, left them you know, without, without hope other than in Christ. So what's new about the new covenant? Uh, God's laws would be put in the minds and written on the hearts from the outset. How did you get into the old covenant? What, what was the, your access into that relationship with God? physical birth, right? And so that was it. And you could be born a Jew and be part of the nation of Israel and not really know anything about God. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people were, right? Not really, didn't ever really know God. And if they ever did come to know Him, they'd have to be taught that. So how is that different under the New Covenant? Everybody in the New Covenant already knows God. They have heard the Gospel. They believed it. They've entered into a relationship through Christ, our sacrifice and high priest, with God. So we come into, we come into the covenant with full knowledge of all of that. So it's, again, the contrast could not be more stark. Um, his, his laws are on our hearts and on our minds from the get-go of entering into the new covenant. Um, so the Lord and His people then would be and are with one another. We have fellowship with God right now. We have access to God right now. We can approach Him and do approach Him in prayer uh, for forgiveness of our sins. We have access to His throne room through the veil, through Christ. And of course, the final uh, conclusion in Hebrews 10 to all of this, we draw near to God through Christ and have all this access. Uh, he's a holy God among a holy people. And again, the writer says in verse 11 that knowledge of God is going to be possessed by every participant in the covenant. And mercy and forgiveness are full and free. you got to love verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. I love that. What's the difference between that and the old covenant? How often were sins remembered? Every year. Right? Every year. And God says, under the new, never going to remember them. The Day of Atonement wasn't really the day of, a Day of Atonement, was it? It was really a Day of Unatonement. <laughs> they, they, re, they remembered their sins. They remembered them. Um, so that's, that's such a huge... You see, again, you see the huge contrast, how much better, uh, how, you know, much more we have under the new than under the old. Verse uh, 13 is pretty important as well in that he says a new covenant he has made the first obsolete what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So 
in, um, in the Greek language, uh, there are a couple of different words for new. Kainos refers to uh, new uh, in kind, new in substance. Uh, neos refers to new in point of time. But here it's kainos, so it's the quality of the thing that's new and different. Uh, <clears throat> not just that it's new in point of time. Uh, it's also new in point of time. It's fresh, if you will. But here... Uh, it's new in point of um, its substance. And this is making this old covenant obsolete. That which is, ob we know about planned obsolescence, right? So my PS1 computer that I bought in 1993, it's no good anymore. You know, those people at IBM, they... They plan for it not to last all that long, not to be good anymore, right? So that's, we understand planned obsolescence. If you have, you know, I, I just, I got, I was going to pull my phone out of my pocket, but I don't have my phone in my pocket. Here you go. Here's my, here's my phone. It's new. I just got it last week. It's the latest, greatest, right? I got it because the one that I had after three years went kabonk. It wasn't designed to last years, I guess. So the old covenant was planned obsolescence. God designed it not to last. It was, uh, we, we studied this in a class the other day uh, with some brethren. And one of the brothers pointed out that was planned from the get-go. It was, it was starting to vanish away from the day it was instituted. From the day you drive that car off the lot, right? <laughs> it starts to depreciate. Well, that's from, from the day that old covenant was ordained, it was starting to age. And now... The writer says it's obsolete. Strong says that means worn out. And it's vet ready to vanish away. And it was nailed to the cross. It was ready to vanish away from the beginning. It was, it was going to vanish away. And I think that's an important way to look at that. So, good lessons from today. Christ is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, biblical silence does not grant permission. As our great high priest, Christ is perfectly suited to help us draw near to God. Is the minister of the true tabernacle and the mediator of a better covenant. Questions? Yes, Mr. Jonah. I was going to say that the old and new covenant has a lot of parallels to our lives as Christians. We live here. We know we're going to die. We live as a covenant. And that's a great observation. I need, I need to. Can I use that in the sermon and not, not tell you that? Not tell anybody that you gave me the idea. <laughs> that, that is. That is really. <laughs> All right. Uh, pick up there. Sunday morning, Lord willing.